Thanks so much uh, to WGA and to Jack and to uh, others who have helped make this workshop possible. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Oppenheimer. I serve as the Government Relations Director here in Boise with the Idaho Conservation League and very pleased to be joined by three esteemed panelists. Uh, first to my left, uh, Mary Mitzos, the President and CEO from the National Forest Foundation. Uh, next to her, Luke Habaker, the Director of Business Development um, and Partnerships with Mast Reforest station based out of Seattle. Uh, and then finally, uh, our cleanup batter is Jill Ozarski, the a program officer with the Walton Family Foundation and based out of Denver. So uh, very pleased to have each of them. And, and as Jack was saying, um, you know, figuring out some of the financing and how to actually put some of this work on the ground is really the focus of this panel. And so uh, getting a sense of, of what this work does look like uh, out in the forests and, and uh, in our um, uh, private and public and, and other lands across the West and what some of the different mechanics are of financing to actually implement those. And so some different uh, strategies and, and approaches that each of these three different organizations um, are engaged with and, and just uh, wanted to note uh, in the case of Jill with the Walton Family Foundation really representing today uh, the Blue Commons, if, if I'm not mistaken. And so anyways, I'll let each of them talk a little bit about the different approaches that they use and to kick us off, uh, Mary. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's always tough being the last panelist on a, in a meeting because the numbers just dwindle. So we'll try and make this interactive and fun as possible. Um, so I'm going to start just at a high level about who the National Forest Foundation is. We are con a congressionally chartered nonprofit and our purpose is to partner with the Forest Service on their mission. So as you can imagine, the work that we do is all about forest, water, carbon, wildlife, and all of the co-benefits that go with forests and grasslands. Um, our purpose in life really is to uh, involve the American public in the stewardship and enjoyment of the national forest system, 193 million acres across the country. Most of those acres, as you know, are here in the West. Um, and as you might imagine too, we're heavily involved in forest stewardship and the wildfire crisis strategy implementation in particular. So how do we do that? Um, we work with our agency partners uh, to make sure that we are working on their priorities with them. We, in almost every place, convene the local community of um, partners and interested citizens to get at what, how do we collaborate together and what is the common ground we want to work on together. Once we have the project and the, uh, as much consensus and collaboration as possible, we go about raising the funds to implement the work. And we raise those funds from any imaginable um, pot that you might think of. So federal, state, and local government, corporations, foundations, individuals. Um, for instance, uh, I'll talk a little bit about a project that we do in northern Arizona, and then I'll probably pass the mic and come back to other project implementations and later questions. So um, northern Arizona, we have what's called a Northern Arizona Forest Fund. Um, it works uh, on the Salt and Verde rivers that you heard about before. That's the lands that are um, of highest concern to Salt River Project, who is the water provider for um, southern Arizona for the most part. Uh, we, um, we have an advisory committee there that's made up of local partners and individuals who help create those priorities for project implementation with us and the Forest Service. And then we uh, raise funds um, from a wide diversity of partners, from a local brewery and a local coffee shop to uh, a company called Pink Jeep Tours that also helps educate the public about um, forestry issues when they go on Jeep tours in northern Arizona. I think it's a really cool partnership. To SRP, the Forest Service, and county governments. We are now, let's see, the Northern Arizona Forest Fund has been in existence for 10 years, I think, and we are now investing about 10 million every year in forest restoration there. So I'll stop there, Jonathan, and we'll come back in questions. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Luke Hawbaker. I'm a director of business development and partnerships with Mass Reforestation. Um, we're a mission-driven company working to scale reforestation post-wildfire uh, to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. 
Um, I'm in this role because my uh, dad's hometown, town of like 120 people in Iowa on a good day, uh, basically died while I was in middle school and high school. Grocery store, bank, library, all there when I was a kid, all weren't there uh, by the time I graduated. And this happened to be in Iowa, but it's probably a similar story to anyone who's been in a lot of the places that have seen mills close around the western United States, um, a system that didn't work for the lands or the people who derive their livelihood from those lands. And carbon and other ecosystem service payments um, that are being innovated presents a opportunity to direct hundreds of millions, billions, Brian, I think, from J.P. Morgan was saying, trillions of dollars, if done well, uh, into those communities and into those industries um, that put folks to work and uh, create sustainable outcomes on the landscape. At MAST, uh, we do that in the forestry space. We do that with reforestation. So we're a vertically integrated um, reforestation company. We spend most of our time thinking about the nuts and bolts and the, the less covered parts of uh, the forestry space. What does seed collection look like? Um, we have a massive seed shortage for uh, reforestation in the western US. Um, how do we expand our nurseries? We have 30 to 40 million seedlings a year coming out of our, our nurseries. Um, two of them, one 130 years old, one 50 years old, able to be kept in business in part because of um, the, the anticipated revenues from carbon. We were able to purchase those when their previous owners were um, retiring and uh, the, un the future was uncertain for them. Um, and we direct uh, the uh, revenue through a project finance facility that we have, $15 million of um, upfront capital that's capable of offering to landowners generally no cost um, reforestation. Uh, reforestation is a quite expensive thing, as you can imagine. Um, and those financiers are paid back uh, through carbon revenue. Um, that enables us to create uh, excellent outcomes on the landscape, ecologically important ones for uh, the land, to generate revenue um, uh, for landowners to help them fulfill their ability to steward their land for future generations. Um, it enables active management. We fund our projects with long-term management endowments that help to create forest, uh, resilient forests in the long term. Um, and it creates long-term durable uh, and additive uh, carbon sequestration for those who are interested in, in um, leaning in and taking steps forward towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality. Thanks, Luke. Uh, I'm Jill Ozarski from the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, the Walton Family Foundation is a water funder. So you might be asking, why are we here uh, when this is a carbon finance panel? So I'm going to explain a little bit about the who are we and, and why are we here and why are we so pleased to be able to help sponsor this, uh, this initiative this year. So at the Walton Family Foundation, we just this year learned that we are actually the largest philanthropic funder for water in the United States, which comes with a huge amount of responsibility. Um, <coughs> We, <laughs> thank you, um, I'll pass that on to the family. <laughs> I am their staff. Um, we are uh, very privileged to have worked in two significant watersheds in the United States for over 10 years now. We fund in the Colorado River Basin and the Mississippi River Basin. We also have an oceans program that funds sustainable fisheries in the oceans. And what we've learned at the foundation over time is that most people experience climate change as water change. You know, real, and, and by water change, it's either too much water or not enough water, or it's coming at a different time of year, or it's dirty, or whatever the difference is. And that's how people are really experiencing climate change. And so that's where we really see an entry point for all of us to come together to, to see how these issues are all united. Our goal at the Walton Family Foundation is to see resilient water systems so that people and nature can thrive together. And that togetherness is really a theme that runs throughout all of our programs. You know, the good thing about these problems is people keep identifying that they're also opportunities. And the exciting thing is that those solutions are coming in front of us just as fast as the problems are. The solutions are hard, they're complex, they're interrelated, 
And that means that we all need to be coming together, not just in the philanthropic sector, but also in the public sector, in the private sector, business, to be working on all these solutions together. So um, when we can come together, that's where you're gonna see the solutions work, but also be more durable over time. And so kind of like we've been talking about uh, in so many of the other panels we've heard over the last two days, you know, just focusing on one thing, just focusing on carbon, might miss the opportunities to also advance things like water or ecosystems or community benefit. And so the more that we're all coming together and thinking about all these issues uh, and balancing at the same time, the better we're all going to be. So... Where I'm here, the, re the reason that the foundation is funding from the, our Colorado River program, this particular initiative, is that we want, we, we're really excited to see this initiative focusing on nature-based solutions as a way to store carbon as well in this future decarbonization economy. And uh, I want, but I want to bring in a nature-based solution we haven't talked about yet. So there's a slide up on there. You know, we've talked a lot about um, the value of forests and the value of rangelands. We haven't talked about the value of wetlands and streams and stream corridors. And, you know, I'm from the Colorado River Program. Our Colorado River Program spans all seven states, from the headwaters in Colorado and Wyoming, all the way down through the desert southwest and into Mexico. We care about the whole basin from the headwaters down to the delta. And when you look at the river long term, you know, this is the hardest working river, not in, in the West, but also in the United States, and some people would say the world. It's one in 10 people in this country rely on it. Um, for drinking water, let alone for our food supply and just the spirit of who our country is. And we're not making more water in that river. In fact, right after this, I'm headed to the big Colorado River Water Users Association conference in Las Vegas. We're not making more water in the river, but we do have an opportunity to restore the headwaters so that we can restore a more natural hydrograph and keep the water that's there clean and thriving. And it also has all these great ecosystem benefits. So what I want you to look at on that slide is the, the, the picture on the left is what a lot of our headwater streams look like. They're incised, they're eroded. When you see early stream melt, that water just rushes down really fast. Uh, you know, my rancher friends say that they're, they, they used to have an irrigation system that started uh, usually about eight weeks later than it is now because spring snow melt happens so fast. And it might only be a couple weeks of irrigation versus it used to be months. And that's because of the, the, how degraded these ecosystems are. When you look at the wetlands piece, if we can reconnect, so that picture on the right, if we can be reconnecting streams to their floodplains and to the adjacent wetlands, that's really the way to look at what our streams and wetlands are. And what you're also looking at in that picture is carbon. There's a lot more carbon stored on the right side of that picture than the left side. So uh, I'm gonna go, I wanna uh, make this more interactive and go into question and answer, but I wanna talk, but when I do have the opportunity, I'm gonna talk about a couple of different projects that the foundation is supporting that is advancing these kind of nature-based solutions across the Colorado River Basin. And specifically, one of the projects I'll talk about that we funded is the Blue Commons project that you highlighted a little bit, Jonathan. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so first question, um, can each of you explain some of the basics of how it is actually implemented on the ground? So uh, some of the finance uh, and fund ag aggregation strategies uh, and approaches and how you actually do the work um, and what some of the strengths and opportunities or disadvantages of each of those different approaches are. So Mary, if you wanted to kick it off, otherwise you welcome to defer to one of your other panels. No, I feel like I kind of revealed that in the, in the opening, but I'll, I'll go into a little more depth. So um, in all the projects that we do, we are a fund aggregator and a fund leverager. So um, that's the only way that we believe we can get projects done at the scale that they need to be done instead of doing uh, what some people refer to random acts of conservation, which are good, but they're not good enough to be at the scale that we need to be in today. So um, we work, our, our staff in the field work with every kind of funder imaginable to give that specific funder 
what they want and need out of the project. Sometimes it's, please estimate my carbon. Sometimes it's, please tell me what water um, uh, benefits I'm gonna receive. Sometimes tell me how you improve the wildlife habitat. Sometimes it's, what kind of jobs are you creating in the local community? So what uh, I, I personally believe we excel at is aggregating those funds from multiple sources over different time frames. You know, some last a year, some last a month, some last five years. And then being able to report back to each specific funder what was accomplished with their money. And when we're working on a, on a scale of the national, uh, the Northern Arizona Forest Fund, we can also do one report so we can go back to all of the funders and say, this is what you were able to achieve together in addition to what you achieved by yourself. Um, and that turns out to be a very powerful motivator to get more people involved. Um, so that's the funding side of the equation. Uh, then what um, we are is just think of us as a general contractor. So we've got a project, we've got the funds, we put out, we either do grants to nonprofits to implement the project, or we let contracts to, um, obviously, local, con local or national contractors to do the work. So if it's, um, if it's fuels reduction, generally that's a contract, as you can imagine, that takes specialized work. Unless, of course, you're doing the, the small fuels reduction of delimbing trees so the, the uh, fire doesn't crown. A lot of that work is done by youth corps with us. And there, it's a fantastic way to get youth involved in the stewardship of our, our nature. And it's also amazing how many of them didn't know that was a possibility and how many of them are choosing or trying to stay in the field. So it el also helps create that future workforce that we're all gonna need. Um, first, I could ask questions of Jill and Mary about innovative finance for an hour each. Um, I think these two organizations have done some of the coolest um, and most important early um, pioneering of innovative finance in the nature space. Um, Ours kind of alluded to it a little bit. Um, we raise upfront capital from investors uh, to pay the costs of um, reforestation for landowners. Sometimes that needs to be leveraged with grants if it's a lower productivity area, um, but our goal is to cover as much of it as possible with that project finance. Um, and then as carbon credits are generated, those uh, investors are paid back. It's fairly simple. Um, but what it means in practice, uh, we can look at a case study of a project of ours in Montana, Sheep Creek Ranch um, in Cascade County, east side of the divide. Uh, in 2021, um, roughly 3,000 of the 5,000 acres of that property burned um, in the Harris Mountain Fire. And uh, that's an area where there's not a lot of industry that's capable of helping landowners reforest of any type. Um, we sort of have a built-in case study from the consulting forester who, who came to us with this project. Um, and he had the previous year, uh, or maybe two years prior, uh, near Missoula had helped a landowner who'd had uh, her land burn in a, in a fire. And there was a large amount of donations that came in from around the country to the United Way of Missoula. Um, he he used, tapped into those, he galvanized um, neighbors to come out and help plant. It's really a, a heartwarming and, and a story of, of in, intrepid determination to um, bring back a, a forest on this, this woman's land. Uh, and that was about 100 acres. Um, and I want to say 25,000 um, seedlings? Yeah, 25,000 seedlings. Uh, and in, nothing I'm about to say is remotely intended to denigrate that. I think it's impressive as hell. Um, but those are tapping into labor pools and sources of capital that are not scalable. Um, you can't guarantee uh, that folks from every state in the union are going to donate after every fire at a scale that's going to enable people to plant, and you can't guarantee that everyone's neighbor is going to come out and plant um, seedlings. Uh, 
Uh, so what we were able to do with our finance is go out, do large-scale cone collection, um, which I promise I will talk about more because it's one of my favorite things. Um, uh, we were able to grow close to a million seedlings um, in our nurseries uh, for that project. And over the course of this year and, and subsequent plantings, we'll reforest 2,700 acres of land. Um, and that's going to generate return to cover costs. It's going to generate return for the landowner, generate return to keep us in business. Um, and that's the basic nuts and bolts of how our, um, our finance works. By the way, good use of the word intrepid. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, before I talk about the specific Blue Commons example, I want to play off what he just said about scaling. So can you pop up the slide I had that has the report on it? So the next one. Um, so I mentioned the big Colorado River Water Users Association meeting conference that's happening. So yesterday, a large group of our grantees released a report, which is on the website resiliencecoriver.org. And this relates directly to scaling, um, because as I mentioned, it's all hands on deck. These you know, one-off projects are fantastic and really cool. But if we're going to scale to do restoration of headwater streams at a level that will make a difference for the Colorado River, we also need to think about uh, large-scale federal investment and other investment and bringing all those together in a fund like uh, potentially Blue Commons can be, which is what I'll talk about in a moment. So this report was released yesterday and has is full of examples of the kinds of projects that the Bureau of Reclamation could fund with the large amount of funding that they received from the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a bucket three, um, sometimes referred to as bucket 2B, um, of funding that is for ecosystem restoration that they have not decided what to do with yet. And that is an opportunity to fund projects across the basin that will make a difference for water and, as I showed in that previous picture, for carbon. Now, the reason they make a difference for water, I want to bring up, because it also brings in where the other finance can come from, is when you're talking about water, um, you're helping with the hydrograph of the river, which, man which ma uh, matters for the environment, obviously, but you're also helping irrigators. A key thing is when these projects are above um, reservoirs, there is a direct connection to helping control sedimentation in reservoirs, which is one of the biggest costs that the water providers have. So this is a, so if you can be funding large scale across the basin, wetlands restoration projects and headwater streams, there is a direct benefit for the environment, but there's also a direct benefit for water providers. There's a direct benefit for all the agricultural producers. Um, that are downstream, and that's not even talking about the actual project on the property itself. So now let me t uh, preview to what Blue Commons is. So uh, Blue Commons is an organization, it's a, it's a private entity that we helped fund a couple of years ago, and it is creating a revolving loan fund for water resilience projects in the Colorado River Basin. And the reason that a revolving loan fund is so important is it starts to create this ability to scale projects. You know, if, 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 the Bureau of, if, if we are successful and if the Bureau of Reclamation funds these projects at scale, and I should say, they already have been. The most recent round of WaterSmart grants that were just released actually funded some extremely cool projects. And, um, but the problem with, with those federal grants, as we all know, is there's a long delay. <laughs> you know, it takes a, first you have to apply. Then you have to wait for the announcement. Then you have to wait for the dollars to actually get into someone's bank account to start the work. Then it might be the wrong season to actually do the work. So when the project is at, so from when the project is envisioned to when it actually begins can be years of delay. And that is bad for a whole long list of reasons that I don't probably need to go into in front of this room. But I mean, there's financial impacts, there are community impacts, and it just loses momentum. So what Blue, what Blue Commons is able to do is to serve as a revolving loan fund so that when they are a partner on one of these projects, and there's a great example in Wyoming that I'll talk about, when they are a partner in one of these projects, they can front the money. Like once the federal grant is, is announced, they can front, Blue Commons can front the money to start doing the project right away. And then it is reimbursed when the federal grant dollars finally come through and continue to circulate through that revolving loan fund. It is also a place where dollars from other sources 
can be deposited and used for projects. Um, the same Blue Commons Fund that is a partner in the, this large Wyoming Sage Creek project, which is, uh, I think now it's up to 30 miles of stream restored right above a reservoir, public, private lands mixed, um, and it's creating great local returns for the ranchers there. Um, that same Blue Commons Fund also is supporting a crop shifting opportunity in Mexico, uh, where Mexico re also relies on Colorado River water. And in that case, Blue Commons is using f uh, donations from corporate donors that are looking for water benefits. And so corporates put money into, Blue, into actually an entity called Business for Water Stewardship that can show that they have offset credits for their water use. Then Business for Water Stewardship gives that can send that money to Blue Commons to be revolved through a fund. Blue Commons is partnering with these farmers and ranchers, in this case farmers, in Mexico to crop shift to a to take to release the um, the risk of crop shifting, so that they can shift crops to something that actually uses less ground, restores area and maintains and actually the goal is to increase the local revenue from the farmers because of the, the crop that they're shifting to. And they're using corporate dollars in that case that can continue to be revolved through. So having that new entity of a revolving loan fund can help enable a whole range of different kinds of projects that are valuable for water and all the different entities that care about water, but also, like I showed in that first picture, there's a bunch of carbon in it too. So it's a way to start packaging up and layering all these different benefits together. And Jonathan, if I could just add one thing. Uh, one key word, Jill, that, um, about federal, state, local, federal government grants is that nine times out of 10, they're reimbursable. So you have to have some money in the door to float your cash position until they get reimbursed. Yeah, that's a great point. Great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for each of, each of the different kind of insights into the different approaches that you use. And w one of the things that I think is, is common across all of the different organizations and, and efforts that you're involved in is the importance of quantifying some of the project benefits relative to uh, actually that carbon capture and, and you know, getting some of the, the repayment as, as a part of uh, carbon credit uh, financing regimes. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges with quantifying those um, and, uh, and how some of those obstacles are being addressed. I always get the pleasure of starting. <laughs> So order of the panel. Um, so what we find is from corporations in particular, they're, they're interested in two things, water benefits and carbon benefits. The water benefits are uh, easier to quantify um, and they can be ver verified through a third party. The carbon benefits, as, as was uh, mentioned m multiple times today, the market's squirrely. So it depends on, on what figures you want to use to give corporations back their carbon benefit. And in addition, because most of our work occurs on federal lands, uh, we can't give them any kind of credit. So for those corporations who really wanna invest big in credits to offset their, their, um, their emissions, uh, right now federal lands can't play in that arena. Um, which is, uh, th there's a lot of different reasons for that. We can go into that if you want to, but um, if you're talking about big investment in quantified carbon, the, all federal land management will be out of that game as it currently stands. Uh, something we hope changes. No. Um, the, uh, uh, we are very fortunate, I think, with reforestation to rest uh, foundationally on a lot of really good science that's lasted over a really long period of time to measure and predict how trees will grow and take those board feet and convert it into, into carbon. Um, that's a gross simplification of what very, very smart people on our team do. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, glad for you know, some of the, the shoulders on which you know, forest, uh, reforestation carbon stands. Um, I think one of the veins I wanted to touch on here was in terms of how you communicate that, um, Jonathan. And it's a, uh, one of our challenges, I think, there is about you know, less of a question about how much uh, carbon's going to be sequestered, but a question of the timelines of some 
purchasers, right? Our Western forests don't grow as fast as the tropics or uh, even the southeastern United States. They're still really important landscapes to manage for carbon and strong, um, uh, especially in the reforestation space, strong opportunities to sequester carbon over the course of 100 years, lock it up for another 100. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we do is when we're working with buyers, we're trying to both meet the urgency, right, of trying to be, you know, neutral or negative by 2030, um, while also making sure that we're investing over a long-term supply of, um, uh, of carbon re removals that are going to come from these um, reforested lands. The quantification one is such a good question. Um, and it's, it's where I think we have some responsibility on the philanthropic side as well. Uh, you know, again, we're not we're not focused on the carbon markets at the Walton Family Foundation. We're mo we're focused on the water side, which means that and and as a philanthropy, we're funding research to help put values to some of these things. And it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. Thank you for doing it. Yeah. yeah well, we I wish we had more. Uh, there's like not enough money to figure this out. Um, but where everyone's doing the best they can. Um, Especially for the water benefits, it, it, as complicated as carbon is, I'm a little biased in that I feel like water gets even a little bit trickier sometimes uh, because you can quantify benefits in one area, but then it goes downstream really quickly. And the downstream benefits or impacts can be, can be very different. We're facing an issue in Colorado right now where there's water rights concerns. Um, there was literally a headline in a newspaper article that said, do beavers need water rights? Um, with the idea being that if we're actually taking some of these degraded streams and restoring them, which is not taking any water away, it's just cha it's just trying to restore a natural hydrograph, um, are we impact is our, I shouldn't be saying we, meaning the global we, um, is our, our water rights being impacted? And so there's, uh, there's a whole series of research researchers, especially Colorado State and Utah State are really making a name for themselves in trying to put um, da data behind some of the dollar values and understand some of these tricky questions. Another one that I'll just put on people's radar that I think personally is really interesting that had never even entered my mind until a couple of years ago is salinity and the connection of salinity to wetlands. Um, the, the, in, you know, the Colorado River has a, a salinity control forum that has significant funding to help alleviate salinity and there are now researchers looking, because the theory, they're, they're testing the theory. The theory is sound that if you're doing headwater stream restoration and improving water quality, is that also a, a way of solving some of the salinity problems in the Colorado River, which is just super interesting, um, but needs data and science, and brings in another funding partner. Back to, like, how do we bring, it, how do we bring all this finance together for folks that care about these issues from different perspectives? Great, um, and uh, just curious if if you might be able to identify, uh, you know, what some of the most significant barriers are in implementing some of these projects, uh, and you can't just use the more money. Uh, so, uh, but so you know, what what is it that's standing in the way, or or if there was a, a magic wand that you had and said, okay, we're going to solve this this piece in order to really kickstart, uh, you know growth in this, um, in your approaches, what would those be? Um, well, I alluded to one in, um, in the federal landscape about how does the carbon market play there when the market is a little more stable than it is right now. Um, you know, as a nonprofit, what you hear often is what we need is sustainable funding. I don't even know what that means because it doesn't really exist. So how, how do you bring, uh, as we've all talked about, the multiple groups together to meet the ends that you want. I think some of the barriers, um, somebody brought it up today, there, there are those who don't believe in, in forest management uh, and sometimes even reforestation. Um, I think they're becoming less of a barrier than they, than they used to be because uh, there's very few people in this country who have not been impacted in one way or another by wildfire. And, um, what used to be maybe 40% uh, of the population who didn't um, understand, who didn't believe that cutting trees was a good thing. 
I would say that population, I'm guessing here, I have no data, is more like 10 to 20% now. Um, so I think we're making really positive progress there. Um, you probably heard it yesterday, I'm sorry I couldn't attend yesterday, workforce is gonna be an issue. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's planting trees or cutting trees or doing watershed restoration. Um, we, we just have not invested in our natural resources for about 40, 50 years, and it shows in the workforce that's coming up. Um, and then, of course, in forestry, uh, markets, markets, markets. Um, there's just, there's not enough places to take the wood or the biomass that needs to come out of these forests. Um, but there's, there's innovative ways to deal with that too. So uh, we have this, what I think is a really cool program called the Wood for Life program. This is not a, a, a solution, right? It is part of a solution where um, we are, are cutting trees um, that don't necessarily have an industry to go to and we're, we're doing partnerships with uh, tribes so they can take the wood back to their reservation that the, and use it as a as a fuel source for um, their members who don't have any other options. And again, not not the solution, but part of a solution to get broader buy-in as well. Yeah, a lot of comparable barriers. Um, I think you know I I'll. We spend most of our time, frankly, thinking about implementation problems, right? And and, and owning nurseries and having the largest private seed bank um, in the Western U.S. is a, a big responsibility to be a part of the reforestation supply chain for everyone, right? We grow seedlings for agencies, for tribes, for industry, um, for uh, uh, private landowners, not just for our projects. In fact, that's a that's a minority of it. Um, so I think a lot of where we spend time as an organization is thinking about how do we solve uh, the seed shortage. We're not going to have reforestation <coughs> if we don't have seed to turn into seedlings to get back onto the landscape. And there's a whole bunch of challenges in that where we're working um, to innovate uh, Funding for cone collection is a, a topic near and dear to my heart, um, a need for seasonal working capital uh, there to get out when there are these rare every two to ten year mast events to um, go collect crop. Uh, you might not be surprised that when you go to ag credit lenders today and you tell them that you have a $6 million um, uh, asset base in the form of seed, um, which is true, and that's at a conservative market rate, they are not exactly familiar with, um, as they put it, pine cones as an asset class. Um, we're working on them, um, and we think we'll get there eventually, but you know, there's, uh, there's challenges there. Um, workforce challenges, you know, we basically set out to try to solve each of the seed, seedling, workforce, and funding challenges for our um, landowners that we're working with, uh, but we certainly face them. Um, we're trying to expand our, seed, our nurseries. We're uh, reliant on the efforts, frankly, of bigger players on the workforce challenge, but we're certainly trying to train folks and hire folks and bring in that next generation of foresters. Um, and then we've already talked funding. Yeah, thanks. So, Mary, I need to share some polling with you because we do have polling on how the national attitude is shifting on folks caring about forests and wanting something to do in relation to wildfire. Am I close? You're close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to quote exact numbers because I don't, I'm not, I, it will not be there. <laughs> but um, but we, it's, it's really fascinating. The public sh is shifting, especially in Western states that are dealing with the, the air quality problems and the direct damage issues. Uh, you both covered workforce, so I won't talk about that. I'm going to talk, but I am going to talk about funding in a different way. Not just the amount of funding, but the color of funding. Um, can you throw up the last slide I had? So this is from that report that I talked about that was released yesterday. Um, this is showing the project life cycle when it comes up. There we go. I'm sorry, it's, it's from the report, which was clearly vertically, a <laughs> vertical report, so y'all can look at the website and see it yourself. But... Um, this is the project life cycle that shows what it takes to put a project together. Most of the federal grant programs are for shovel-ready projects. Haven't we heard that? Or maybe it's for planning. It's for, specific fa it's for a specific part of the cycle. But the cycle is huge, and it takes years. And the, the hard-to-reach dollars at those different cycles are what the barrier is to sometimes getting projects actually moving and done. Um, so the initial development stage is a place where there's a, often a lack of funding. That's where people are 
coming or starting to do the partnership work. Like you need bodies, you need people, FTEs on the ground to do that work. You need to be able to do the early planning and design work. You need to be able to contract with people to do uh, to put the projects together. Not the detail, not even the detailed engineering, but just the concepts of being able to pull data together. And that takes time and money and energy. And you know, we in philanthropy are, are proud to help support some of that, but it, to be able to do it at scale, we need to be able to figure out how to, uh, if, if the federal agencies can use the ability that they have within their existing grant programs to make it easier to do some of these earlier stages, it will open up the floodgates of projects. I always hesitate to use a water, a, a <laughs> water pun, but this isn't just a water audience, so I gotta get it out of my system before I get to Krua. Um, the, it, and so all these other stages are also critical, and then this is where like the Blue Commons entity comes in. Blue Commons, since they're gonna be a revolving loan fund, can help do some of these pieces. Like they can help front the money on the fundraising side, waiting for the big federal grants, the big infrastructure money to come in, or the big state money to come in, or the big water utility money to come in. So we're trying to, so, so we at the foundation are aware of this project life cycle and are trying to get a handle on how to speed up some of these pieces. But um, that is a barrier right now, is the fact that there is funding available for some of the stages, but not for the earlier ones. And that means that you're start, that without having that funding for bigger projects, it becomes more, you're inherently creating a piecemeal approach. It's that conservation, what the, the term, the random acts random of conservation. Acts of conservation. Yeah, you're inherently creating random acts of conservation because the communities that are excited about this or that have a little bit of the funding can do it, and it won't be watershed scale. So uh, the, the way to get to scale is also to think about how to free up money across that life cycle. Great. Uh, thank you so much, and we're going to uh, get to audience questions here in just a minute, but uh, I'm going to pose uh, the first one as a, a moderator's prerogative uh, to Luke uh, why are you so excited about cone collection in three minutes or less? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's oh, a question I'm thrilled. that's on everyone's mind. <laughs> um, so uh, said it, we need um, hundreds of tons more uh, seed for uh, post-wildfire, um, post-beetle kill, uh, reforestation efforts for afforestation, for timber um, and our working lands, we need a lot more conifer seed. Um, conifer seed is hard to get. Uh, so first off, you have these difficult, um, it's hard to time, uh, both in terms of when it's gonna come around in a year and when you get to go in a given year. Every two to 10 years, you'll have a mast event where all the species of a given, um, all the trees of a given species will create uh, comb producing um, or seed bearing cones. And then within that year, you have maybe a two week period where they're basically ripe enough to go out and get those. Um, they can't you know, ripen off the, off the tree, though there's some interesting science happening there. Um, and you, if you take them too early, those seeds won't germinate. Uh, so you gotta time it right. And then you have to, in that window, you send these uh, climbing crews. And there's probably three, maybe four of them in the Western US that are capable of operating, so they're in high demand. Um, and they go scale these large uh, conifers. They put cones in bushel bags and then they drop them. Um, and you transport them back to a seed processing facility. We have one of the largest in the, in the nation. It's a, a probably 80 or 90 years old. We keep it working with 3D printed parts that are custom to the initial kind of um, uh, workings of that. Um, and then we make that seed available for, for purchase kind of on the, on the open market um, for uh, uh, different agencies. You know, I think we've got probably more seed for certain states than some of the um, uh, Department of Natural Resources do. Uh, and that's a really important part of our mission is, is scaling that, um, which brings into question all sorts of things around funding and land access and how do you work with state entities to get access to lands? How do you work with the Forest Service? A conversation Mary and I have had a few times um, to get access to, uh, to collect the seed. Um, but it's really you know, how we safeguard the future of uh, America's forests in a um, changing climate uh, going forward. 
Great. All right. Thanks for the chance. Yes. Absolutely. I didn't ask it. For absolutely. That. I, I knew I knew you were gonna you, you wanted to take it. So uh, threw the fastball over the plate. Um, so uh, I'm not seeing my oh there's a microphone over there. Uh, show me your hand if you're interested in in posing a question. There we go over in the the corner. Well, first I gotta apologize to everybody because I'm on this microphone way too much. But. <laughs> It's, this is really a great conference. I'm so glad that um, I took the time to be here. It's been very exciting, and, and uh, I really appreciate the enthusiastic panel in this one, too. So all of you on the panel, I applaud what you're doing. And, and Ms. Uh, Ozarski, uh, I love your slide, because uh, the incised crick, I deal with that. Um, very engaged in enhancements of my repairing areas, and you're exactly right. It uh, the beaver dam analogs that I've done, they're pretty simple because in my ranch, the rangeland in, in eastern Oregon, I don't have uh, year-round streams. It's all intermittent. And But I'm just, I embarked about seven years ago on my very first uh, enhancement to the repairing area, and, and it was only through some grant opportunities through NRCS and then the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, which has been huge because to be honest with you, you don't make enough off the back of a cow to do these things. And it's, that's just the way that it is. So I won't really want to be, uh, appreci I am appreciative of that. But it was absolutely the most <laughs> miraculous thing I saw when I came back to it the next spring and saw the widening of the, of the wet strip. It was just, I, my, I, it was truly a, a dropping moment for me. And where I'm talking about is rangeland that my dad bought in 1956. I was one year old, so I'm an old codger, uh, of course. But no one could be more enthusiastic about what you're doing. And I would really love to get with you and talk about it further on the dry side of, of Oregon, where I only get thir 13 inches of moisture, so we've got to really manage it uh, dramatically. But you're totally right. There's, there's every, there's um, the thing that I really uh, is, I really want to preach. I'm going to call you an evangelist, Jill, because you, all of you up there on the, on the panel are great. But what you're saying is so on, so straightforward and direct. You're right. It's all there's all benefits, multiple benefits to be realized: increased forage growth, increased wildlife habitat, and oh, by the way, it's increased economic viability for me that run cattle and and have longer season grazing and, and off stream watering uh, things that that we can do. It's just a multitude of things. But so anyway, I just want to really, uh, when I saw that, I thought, man, that's exactly right because my wetlands will never look like, like what you're, you've got in the picture because I just don't have that much water. I'm at, I'm at about 5,000 5, to 6,000 feet, so I'm at the headwaters. But the, the amazing improvement in such a short time, if you just protect it and give a little human element to it and, and provide management things, it's... I wish I could show the world what's going on out there because it just it, it, it thrills me to my, my soul that when I leave this earth, my sons will be able to take that and, incur and in increase that. So it's, it's really a great thing. And it makes a connectivity to, you know, maybe I'm a rancher, which I am, but I really want to connect with my urban and metropolitan citizens because I feel like the closer they get to know me, and what I'm doing, we're gonna we're gonna create a, a real communication link there because they're gonna like what they see. So anyway, and you're right about the carbon sequestration, the increased forage growth is just phenomenal. Once you retain that water and slow it down, it's just it's like I say, it's nothing short of miraculous. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for restoring your ranch, Dave. That's cool. Uh, any other questions out there? Um, not seeing any. All right. <laughs> I got one. Uh, Mary, earlier you started uh, to talk a little bit about the considerations around carbon credit generation on federal public lands. I was wondering if you could go into that a little further, just some of the, I guess, the opportunities and pitfalls of uh, potentially allowing that or, or how the agencies could consider it. Uh, yeah, it's probably a conference in and of itself, I will say. Um, well, so right now, the markets are too squirrely to do anything, and that needs to settle out. Um, 
There is great debate whether or not uh, if federal land management agencies enter into the carbon market somehow, what does that do to the private market? Is, it, is the land so big that it will overtake the market in an unfair advantage? I think there's a lot of discussion that can be had around that. Um, the second big piece is whose numbers do you use and how do you verify them and who verifies them? Um, so the Forest Service is working on um, what they're calling carbon certificates um, as a pilot project. It's not completely rolled out yet, um, but I can, and I've told them, <laughs> from our perspective, you likely won't get big corporate funding for certificates because it's not what corporations are looking for. They need something um, a little more, I don't know if valid's the right word, but it's the word that comes to mind right now. Um, and I, I also think, and I, I'd like to acknowledge Catherine in the room here, I think um, when it comes to wildfire, we're missing a big component of what could be in the carbon market, and that's avoided cost. And it's, um, it's, you know, Catherine has done a lot of the work on, on this, um, that you do have a dip in carbon when you take wood off the landscape, but what remains 10 years later is an uptick in carbon. Um, and my personal opinion is the only place that that can be done at scale is on Forest Service land because then you have the insurance pool to back up the carbon um, sequestration because the area you, you treated might have been, might have burned in, in 10, 15, 20 years, but there's other lands out there in that pool that can uh, cover that insurance. So those are probably the biggest ones and I'm probably missing about 10 others. And I guess building on that a little bit in your response and maybe direct this one towards Luke, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, whether some of the projects that, that MAST has been involved in have been impacted by wildfire and just, you know, whether it's relied on some insurance approach or kind of how that has impacted the trajectory. And then just looking at Jonah here, do we need to wrap up here after this question there and get to the, the final wrap up? Yeah. Time check. Okay, great. Cool. So, um, Thanks for that. Um, so a lot of our projects are, are young. We're a young company, and so um, we're thankfully not at a place where seedlings we've been planted have been at risk of wildfire. Um, we do, you know, n have uh, both insurance mechanisms and kind of contingencies in place to account for that in the methodologies that we use. Um, one is that there's an immediate, you know, one, we're quite conservative in how we model our, our carbon. We're doing site-specific core samples um, of trees uh, so that we're not in a position where we're inadvertently overcrediting. No one in this company got into the business to do that. Um, Second, uh, there's a deduction on those further that goes into an insurance pool uh, that is managed by the um, reserve. Uh, the, we use the Climate Action Reserve's um, climate forward methodology. Uh, we are methodology agnostic. That one just works the best for our projects. Um, and then uh, there are stipulations built in for a landowner to um, uh, attempt reforestation twice in the event of a future disturbance. Um, and that's a big obligation that a landowner is taking on. It reflects, I think, the long-term commitment and stewardship that these landowners have. Um, that looks slightly different on public versus private ground, um, but in a private situation, that's, that's built into an easement. Um, and that's really part of why we, you know, we equip them with a long-term management endowment is so that they're in a position where they can fund that first pre-commercial thin um, that can then help to fund that commercial thin, which then enables, you know, you to have this uh, resilient um, forest in the future. Our last thing we want to do is plant it chock full of uh, way more trees than should be there, but rather to bring back a forest that's, you know, uh, looks more like what would have been there in a natural fire regime. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you uh, to our panel, and please join me in recognizing them. So. <laughs>